let the interview begin. Sweet. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the For Loving Us podcast. I'm here with Stephen Costantino. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for being here. Hello. How are you doing? Doing very well. Thanks for joining me today. I know it's been a while since we were meant to get this done, but I know you're obviously a busy guy with conventions and being on the road in general. So how is... Well, COVID, COVID didn't help. Oh, well, <laughs> of course. That's a massive thing as well. So how have you been, you know? Good. I'm glad to finally connect with you because uh, I know you've been... Uh, it's been a, bit, a year and a half or two we've been trying to do this. and Oh, it's been a long time. Finally, finally you know? <laughs> yeah. So but I'm uh, doing good. Uh, doing music at home and then... um gearing up to go on the road again nice. uh, have a lot of shows coming up because a lot of stuff before COVID kind of canceled out and I just did a big surge of them coming back uh, the past six months I'm finally home for a minute but it's starting up again which is good I can't wait nice. you know, I just uh, wish the COVID would be behind us for good now finally yeah I'm hoping we're you know sort of coming out of the tunnel now and sort of going towards the better side of things hopefully you know, you know. yes um, so obviously the huge thing obviously you're known for is obviously Star Wars as the as the Gamorrean guards so give yes. us a bit of backstory of how you got involved with the Return of the Jedi and you know acting in general yeah well I had a, a band with well I met I was doing when I first moved to Los Angeles I was in a martial arts class and, and my sensei said you have to meet Corey D he's one of my best martial arts students and plus he plays, plays the funkiest bass and so um I, that's why I met him. He was living with his dad, Billy D. Williams, then in Los Angeles. And uh, as soon as we started playing, that was it. We we haven't stopped to this day, you know, when we're together. Nice. And um, we're rehearsing that April in the garage because Billy D. was very supportive of, of us and he really believed in what we're doing. And we're trying to get a, a development deal. Back in the day, you would do three songs and they would, you know, see if they're going to approve it to give you a full deal. So in the midst of that, and then Billy Deep walks in and says to Corey, would you like to stand in for me in Yuma in April? And it's like 120 degrees. And Corey's been on many sets. And he said, I don't know. You know, I'd like to finish the, what we started here. Why not roll? And, and then Billy said, would you like to come and bring the guitar and continue to write on the set? So that's what I did. So I was very grateful to be there. Had all the amenities for Billy. And uh, I was on the set, which is uh, like a 45-minute drive from the hotel. Yeah into the desert where the solid pit was and where they shot the wide angle lenses. But of course, long days, sand blowing, you can't, you know, you can't control nature. And, um, but the third or fourth day was restless. And uh, Howard Kazan's going to take Billy out. We were invited to go to dinner. So I asked him, could I, you know, I work for free. Let me do something while I'm here. Use me. I mean, I appreciate everything you guys are doing, being a guest yeah. with Billy, Corey. And so the next day, they made me the guard and Corey by that time had been standing in and doing stuff for his dad already. But then they made him clot two on the barge scene on top, the, 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 the you know, pivotal scene of the movie. And Billy D had taken a picture of us with our mask off, Corey and I, but they would never, you know, put out into public then. It would kind of put in the archive. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then about, you know, I'm, I'm still a musician. Corey's a musician. He moved to Atlanta and, um, out of nowhere, um, I guess that thing surfaced at Dragon Con. I think Billy was there and Corey was guest with him and the picture came out. And the guys from England who do the um, show in Burnley, they said, uh, that's you that got killed by Luke? I said, yeah. They said, can we get your autographs? Because even though in my head, the stuntmen did a lot of the work, I still fought, fought it out with Luke on the barge and got chopped in half. Never went to the pit, just got chopped in half there. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, you know, the the, uh, the guys from Britain said, let me send you like a bunch of items. So I got like 60 items with a check. I signed them all. They went out, they started to go online. And then Corey, agent at the time, yeah, you know, agent um, that handles Billy for, for appearances, had said, um, you guys want to start going out and tell your story. So we did. And um, it's been 11 years I've been on the road. It's pretty unbelievable. It's kismet for sure. Wow, it's just amazing. growing, growing. The character just growing now. You know, I've heard backstories of the Mandalorian. Yeah. You know, from the Mandal that that he gets had to fight to the death. Oh yeah. And I yeah. kind of thought I kind of thought they got thinner as time went on, but it's, it seems like they get thinner in the future, not in the past. 
But as you see in Boba Fett, that, that scene where he comes out of the sand, that's the final scene I did. You know, it's, so some somewhere that story might come, I guess the story's going to come back. How he got killed, well, thought he got killed, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. I don't know. He's the only one who survived the pit, I think, you know. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, you, 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 the Gamorrean guards are green. So, how long did that take to put on? Or is it like a costume? Or is it all paint? It wasn't much. It was the feet, the hands, the big bottom, the big top, the head, and some circles around my eye for makeup. And, um, you know, it's hard to breathe. They put a blow dryer in my mouth. And I could, my peripheral vision was off, so I could just see the footsteps on the ground and follow that. Uh, I don't know where the cameras were. So that's how I got stayed in the camera, I guess, because, you know, it's not like I had any cues or anything. <laughs> just just follow the footsteps to fight. And that's what I did, you know. And and uh, the, the costume, the weird thing was when they took the top off to relax, I was a company dumpy, so Corey had to hold me up because I didn't want to commit to the thick of the bottom again. It was just yeah. a pain, you know. Um, so Boba Fett's obviously just dropped and obviously the Gamorrean guards have returned to the Star Wars universe as you discussed. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on him? Boba Fett? Yeah, yeah. Well, I love the, the new one, uh, the spirituality of it. And him being a more, you know, more uh, his descent is indigenous. It's almost like their journey too. Yeah. I don't know if you saw Once of Warriors or any of his films. He, he's incredible and... Um, I thought the spirituality is really nice that because he, he doesn't want to live by, by live by fear. He wants to live by justice and respect. So in a way it takes that kind of um, spirit building and that he went through in the desert. It's almost like, you know, cause Castaneda or something, you know? Yeah. And uh, I love that spirituality side and how it's become stronger. And I love where it's going because those guys, they don't have any scrutiny. They could kind of take lim. They have no limitations as long as they do it right and, and, and respect the text and what's been going on. They could pull from you know the rebels and the animated and make a whole story around it. With it, they couldn't do that with the prequel in you know sequels. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, obviously there wasn't as much source material back then, and obviously as you just said, there's a lot of material now for them to go off and make as many stories yeah. as they want to. And yeah, John yes. Favreau is doing a fantastic job with the series. I agree. And Filoni and the other, yeah. you know, six directors, the way they embrace each other and believe it's a great team. And, and the greatest films that I love, like Apocalypse Now, all these great films, there's a great team involved. Yeah, exactly. You know, there, was, there was a camaraderie, like a band almost, you know? Yeah. And uh, it, t- it takes that, believing together, wanting to get it done properly and do the best you can do. You yeah, know? I totally so agree. That's, uh, yeah. I love the, you know, the um, behind the scenes uh, galaxy. What is it called? Gallery? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, gallery, yeah. The, Star's Gallery, yeah, yeah. Because the volume sets are a game changer to begin with. They have the volume sets are all LEDs and and um, the actors actually feeling they, they, they immersed in a scene all around them makes for better acting. And using props, which goes back to the trilogy, they had props and it, it was ingenious how they put the props together with carbureted parts, whatever, you make guns and they distress it. And just I love that you know, ingenuity and 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 then um, genuineness that they put through it. And that kind of brought it back with the, the set, the volume sets, because they tried to do it for a long time. And the green screen was kind of like that, but it was very cut and dry, cookie cutter. Yeah, They, they had to act looking at your screen. And then I guess Favreau did the immersive, I don't know if it was um, Lion King, I guess, but then he started the idea with Jungle Book, as you saw. And coming to that with the LEDs really makes for something. You know, for, if you're going to do sci-fi and special effects, you can't get much better. I think it's a, it's going to change the whole industry. I mean, you could shoot Lawrence Arabia inside like that in the desert now, if yeah. you wanted. Yeah, you exactly. Know? Yeah, I think Star Wars has unlimited, you know, things they can do with, you know, the, as you said, the visuals, the costumes, the CGI. There's so much they can go with the show, and it's going to be incredible to see the future of it, for sure. Yes, um, but I think Fabro and Filoni really get it that they want to put them in outfits yeah, and have them, you know, because of that volume set, they're able to do that more. Instead of saying, oh, let's put them, instead of wearing the outfit, let's put it on the green screen. They don't have to do that. They'll get the character to immerse themselves all yeah. around, you know, and be in that scene. And it's real time. The sun goes down in real time. And, 
you know, they had a lot of shadow problems with green screens. And I mean, if they want to have a backdrop, not the green screen, but yeah, yeah, actually in the film, you know? Yeah, of course. Um, so amazing. yeah, absolutely. Um, what would you, how long are you on set for for these, uh, for the Gamorrean guards then on a, on a daily basis? Well, a few weeks we were out there, but I think we shot, it was like two or three days and nice. that was it. I mean, it was a, a, a fleeting moment, you know? Yeah. Definitely kismet to, to being getting getting stronger than ever now. I mean, nothing I could imagine or plan, you know, yeah. at all. That's the thing, you know, you say you're only on there for three days and it was a random role in a way. But any yeah. crazy don't do you find it crazy the fact that people go to conventions to meet you and to discuss Star Wars? Do you find that all crazy to you? It's pretty absurd, but you know what? I love, especially in the world with all these troubles now, the people are just between the 501st, which I'm, I, don't, I don't remember, who really support him and dress up and I know, you know, and make us look good. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, celebration of 2,000 stormtroopers. Now I imagine it's going to be 2,000 Boba Fett too, you know, with this going on. But, um, yes, incredible to see four generations of cosplayers. Grandma, yes. mom, their, their kids, their kids. So, in a sense, it's a really beautiful thing. And um, I meet great people everywhere I go. And there's lot, lots of compassion and love for it. And everyone just wants to enjoy it. And that's a great thing because there's so much going on in the world. Then you go out and do this. It's like music. You go and perform and people love it. And there's no, there's no, um, screw, you know, just fear or any of the stuff going on. Yeah, exactly. The conscious of their mind. So I think it's fantastic for uh that lives on throughout Europe and South America and all over the universe. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, it truly is. And, and it inspires people and fulfills them. Yeah. In ways, you know, especially anime too. I see a lot of kids, you know, they're probably, you know, loners and, but they all get out together and they dress up in the anime world, which I'm part of when I'm doing these shows. And it's incredible that the kids get to make shift costumes. It's not as, you know, extreme as Survival First. And a detail, but when it comes to that, the kids, it's great for the kids to feel some self worth to get out and not be home depressed, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's why I love conventions. It's truly changed the way people can be about what they love, you know, because it's brought all these yes. people together from anime, Star Wars, Marvel, everything, just to unite them in one place for a day or two. Yes. Which is incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you talked about music and obviously with Corey. Um, yes. Where you where do you want to go with that? I know you're on the road and stuff. Um, what you wanted to do with that? Well, I have a studio at home. I'm still I'm making records at home now, mixing and mastering. Oh, nice! It took quite, it took a lot of time, and my songs seem to be pretty timeless. You know, back in the day, it was changing genres because um, back in the day, I worked with Brett Mazur at Gotti Brothers. He's like my little brother. It's such a talent. And he, was, he did Bill Bell DeVoe Poison. He, he got Black IP started. And I was wow. a Scotty, but they, they would all come through and I would play on a lot of stuff. And then they did a new edition comeback. And I played on that. So even though I was the biggest hip hop, I didn't know a lot about hip hop, even though it's my era from New York. That's where the genesis of it was. Um, I played a lot of hip hop because they wanted my, I had a really, you know, they wanted that style that's real. Yeah. With the guitar. And, um, you know, that led to, him starting Crazy Town and me playing on the guitar on the Crazy Town record. And then um, I also had a band for many years with Billy Worth and the Lost Boys, the Cronies. And now we're doing a retrospective. We're doing, because we have such stuff, videos and music and different eras where, you know, we got great things out of it. So we're picking the best of each and doing a timeline, retrospective and new stuff. A lot of songs that have been written back in the day uh, I can finish at home now. I can really mix and master like a record at home. And, it, you know, it's, it, that's an amazing feat right now, the, the way analog and digital have met. Yeah. And um, it gives me the, even though the songs have been sung and around the world and people have been touched, uh, and I recorded some of the studios where they, you know, budget ran out. It's different now. But now I can really fulfill and see my goals and the music in, in a, in a comfortable way and um it really comes together and i'm, I'm excited to put this stuff out because it's, it's, it's timeless besides right. my ep you know yeah. i was very lucky with my um cd because i had great musicians on there 
had Mark Shulman play drums on a few cuts from Pink and Cher, and he's a Pink now. James Bradley Jr., who was one of the finest drummers in the world, was a prodigy at six years old, played with Anita Baker and, and Chuck Manzioni, and, and then wow, Crazy nice. Town for a while, and Mary's Danish, and Slash, uh, Snake Pit, and I had phenomenal tracks, but they seemed a little dated. Yeah. yeah. So when I was 30 years old, I decided to go to school again for engineering because I really wanted to know the lingo. Technically, as much as much as my emotions, but I wanted to be able to talk in the studio and you know cut 10k here. But that, but that helps and to, to know language and communicate to get things done faster. Yeah, yeah. So my teacher was Malcolm Cecil on a lot of my classes, and it was indelible education because he he designed Tanto. You ever had Tanto the keyboard? It was the first sequencing keyboard. It took up a whole room. Arps, Moogs, and they had to be manned by a bunch of guys. All it's right. not like now you, you plug into MIDI, they call it a USB, and yeah, everybody yeah. talks to each other. I don't know if you how much you know about engineering, but or, or instruments like that, but one can control everything, all the sounds and banks. And, but then they were full on, and I think it's in a museum in um, Canada, but they did an album called Malcolm Cecil, uh, did, did an album called um, Tanto's Revolving Headband, and his partner was Robert Mogolov, who I'd met them. Because we go to, we didn't have studios that are working, so we go to outside studios to do hands on. And the story goes on that album, uh, Tanto's Revolving Headband, all these sounds are made from that. And I think it influenced the Moody Blues, and Weather Report, and jazz, and uh, a lot of pop music, all the synths, you know, into the, what we have now. Yeah. And what happened is one day, Stevie Wonder heard the album, and knocked on the door, and said, How do I get these sounds? What, what's going on here? And they wanted to produce all Stevie Wonder's albums. Oh, wow. So a few years back, like three or four years back, I ran into, well, Malcolm died last year, but I ran into Robert. He lives in LA, Muggleluff, and he said, I always liked the music, and Malcolm was always a fan. What he'd been doing is, so I have these tracks. I, I feel like they, um, they kind of dated, but they're such great musicians. I like to make it, you know, pay homage to those guys. I've, I've been part of it. And we produced it, my EP together in it. Finally, I did the vocals over some of the guitars and it really uh, came to life. And I'm very happy about that, that I could put that to rest and move on. And that also taught me how to make records properly in my own wow. studios, my studio built. Yeah. Nice. That's amazing. It's awesome to hear that. Yeah. So it's exciting. You know? Nice. Uh, so obviously, music is clearly a huge part of your life and obviously the oh, Gamorian yeah. Gods. So yeah. is there anything else that stands out to you that you look back on fondly? Well, I can't thank Billy D and, and Corey D. Williams. They changed my life. And I love those guys, you know, they're like family. And um, the West led. The other, the other great thing is um, all the behind the scenes guys, the puppeteers and people I work with, that's an incredible fabric to the whole thing. Those guys, you know, make it happen. Yeah. And as time goes on, a lot of stunt guys go out and they get to tell their stories. There's a lot of main characters, you know, except for Mandalorian, the new main characters. There's not many of them left, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, when I was at 2015 Celebration, Carrie was there. Um, Peter. Peter May was there and yeah. Kenny. And it, it, it's they're all gone now. It's a shame. It is. And obviously the likes of Harrison Ford aren't getting any younger, are they? So, you no, know. no, no. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, Billy, too. Billy, Billy's, you know, Billy D, too. He's uh, in his 80s and he still looks great. Is he in his 80s? But, Oh, wow. Yeah, like 81, 82, I think. Jesus. And the, the road is tough, you know? It's tough sometimes. Yeah. Even with all the amenities, especially with COVID now, it's really tough. Exactly, yeah. And I've been traveling a lot, but I just try to get the best of it and try to be as comfortable, comfortable as I can, you know? Yeah, so you can and do. Stay, stay really safe, of course, you yeah. know? Of course, yeah. Oh, I was just tracking back to Star Wars. Obviously, you said you worked with, obviously, Luke Skywalker in the film. Did you yeah. get to interact with Mark much? Oh, yeah. Well, you, see, you ever seen a scene of us in the trailer? Mark's kind of in his robe and his underwear with Corey and I. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so Mark, well, what happened? We arrived on a Sunday, so everyone was off at the hotel. We didn't even go to the set. And the first person I met was Peter Mayhew. He was in a hot tub because everybody's relaxing by the pool. Behind the hotel, they had these little apartments. And, and um, he was towering over me in a four-foot hot tub. Oh, God. Wait a minute. Can you see me? Yeah, I saw it, yeah. It says I got like 
percent on my battery. Yeah, that's fine. But um, yeah. So Peter was the first guy I met, and Mark ran up, and it, it was Mark was fantastic. You know, everyone's you know, and, and Carrie flying in from LAX, me myself, my, oh, wow. myself, Corey, yeah. Billy, and her. She sat next to me. She was reading Dune, and um, it was she was amazing too. You know, um, everyone. I mean, it, it was incredible to see. That kind of like like a beehive, you know, they, the way they put it together. Yeah, they they, they spill the whole monop- metropolis, you know. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's pretty pretty amazing to this day. Uh, I just want to finish one final question before we wrap things up, and that's: uh, Are you wanting to work on anything new coming up? Obviously, I know you're working on your music, as you said. But would you like to get in any directing, writing, get back into the acting world anytime soon, or are you done? Well, with that never world? really. Yeah, well, it was never really. In act, it happens. I produced a few films. I produced a film of course Starlight with Billy Worth and Ray mm. Dunchong and Willie Nelson in Canada. And then before that, my friend who did the same guy directed, we did Walking After Midnight, Ringo Star narrated. So I like producing, I like bringing the great right people together. Because yeah. when I love something, I love it. I do it from passion. And um, and of course they have to, you know, be successful in some way. Yeah, yeah. But right now I'm trying to compile the stuff with Billy Worth and, and the cronies that whole history because Billy White always was shooting Polaroids or high eight. And there was five years. I haven't, you know, we didn't even look at the footage, but now I like to revisit that and kind of make a documentary about that era in Hollywood. Like when River Phoenix was around, mm. all this stuff was happening, you know, uh, the vibe was happening. Billy and us always playing music everywhere we would go. I mean, we would take over parties and just show up with all instruments. And at the time, we had Jim Morrison on Cliff with us. And Russ the Peak was playing with us, who passed away. He was in Crazy Town later. And then uh, Pretty Things signed to a Virgin. And there's a host of stuff there. Just I feel like people would love to see. Because yeah. if we don't show it, no one will get to see it. We were Very truly true. lost boys. Truly lost boys back then. All right, that's awesome to hear. And thank you for everything today, Stephen. It's been great chatting with you. Oh, finally. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, uh, thanks for your patience. I know it took a while. And of course. Don't you worry. had something, I had something, and you, you, you really kept trying. And I know you're genuine. And uh, I appreciate, you know, sticking with me to be on finally. Yeah. You know? And hopefully I'll get to meet you this year. Yeah, well, like you said, if you do if you do come to England, I'll do my best to uh, be at one of the conventions you're at and come and see you in person. That'd be cool. I want to go back to Manchester. They think I'm Maradona and, and Manchester <laughs> and Italy too. When yeah. Italy, really, Maradona. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll take that. Maradona. <laughs> That's brilliant. I know. I know. I like the football. Yeah. I love it as well. Yeah. Who's your team? Manchester United. Of course. Yes. They were going at it when I was there in the streets. Yeah, they're a bit crazy over it. <laughs> they want to fight each other. Well, the buzz want to fight each other. It's like gangs in New York, you know? Oh, God, yeah. We have firms over it. Very rough. I know. It's, it's, it's really rough. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, man, those... I'm from Hoboken, New Jersey on the water. You know, it's it's sea level with Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. So it's two square miles. Frank Sinatra was born there. And, of course, British has always had a place in my heart, the affinity for it. Because we're a lot alike. The people on the seaports, you know, the, yeah. the, the songs. And of course, the prison invasion as a guitar player. I've been playing Jeff Beck, Clapton. I saw Led Zeppelin three times. So, you know, they put the blues back to us. So um, I feel like kindred spirits big time, like we're family in, in a bigger sense. Yeah. Uh, the same, you know, the same uh, experiences. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, well. Uh, thanks again for your time. It's been really cool chatting with you. And, you know. My pleasure. I, I do hope we meet you one day, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And let me, send me this when it's done so I can take a look. Yeah, it should be your, I think, in a couple of weeks. Up. So, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll post it up. Nice one. Well, thank you for that. You're uh, welcome, brother. I'll see you soon. Take care for now and all the best. Ciao. Bye.